I'm Matt Gray, and I'm joined weekly by Dr. J. We're both certified financial planners, and we talk about how child-free life impacts your finances. This is Child-Free Life and Money. Matt Gray here, uh, episode three of Child-Free Life and Money, joined by Dr. J. As always, today we're finally getting into our topic of expertise here, our topics of expertise. We're getting into the basic financial differences for the child-free community as compared to the general population as a whole. Like what items really pertain to the child-free more so than everyone else, uh, or in some instances, less than the rest of the population. So uh, yeah, this is, this is probably our preferred topic. We'll step a little bit away from the social today and a little bit more into the money side of things. Uh, with that being said, uh, Dr. J, I know you and I have discussed this in pretty good length about the differences, and you and I often bounce ideas off of each other around uh, these types of topics, but hit, hit me with a few of the main ones that we often see as really uh, being applicable to the child-free community. I, I think, uh, by the way, we may have different answers and that's okay too. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know, different uh, perspectives. I think one of the things that I want to make sure, like we make sure on the money side, we, we call out being child-free does not make you rich. Okay. It just doesn't sure. automatically like make you rich. The way I look at it is income disparity still exist, but if you're struggling, you know, you're barely keeping your head above water. If you had a kid, you would drown. That's right. kind of like, it just, it doesn't automatically make you rich. So let, let's right. just throw that out there. Um, this is not a talk for, hey, you're child free and you're automatically rich. Um, I actually saw they're, they're doing a reality show for your wild child free life to talk about like, you know, the lifestyles are rich and famous for child free folks. Right, right. I was right. like, I'm not sure that's where we want to go, but all right. <laughs> right. It's actually, all right. So I'm going to cut you off here really quickly before you even give me any answers to my question, because uh, there's this academic, his name's Dr. Russell James, and he specifically uh, researches charitable giving. But in some of his research, he dives down to like, if you have kids or don't have kids, um, like education level, like he splices the charitable giving community. But one of the things he looks at is net worth and these different demographics to see if there's a correlation with giving, which there is, but that's for another day. But one thing that he noted is child-free people, and this, I should uh, disclaimer here to, to get definitions correct. It's anyone without children. So childless, child-free, all of that group together uh, are about 5% on average higher net worth than those with children, which by definition is slightly wealthier, but it's not like they have three vacation homes and are wealthy that naturally, if you're spending less on raising children, on average, you'll have a bit more, but it's not, to your point, a magnitude of more wealth. 5% is fairly meaningless in the grand scheme. If you had 100,000, they got 105,000. Okay, that's that's fairly small difference. So well, just wanted to back up your point there. I, I'm with you. In the census, by the way, they use the term childless. They're talking about biological children in the census. They found that the highest net worth were actually the single ladies, uh, single childless ladies had the highest net worth. It wasn't a significant difference, but it was just, you know, a couple right. grand higher. Right. Um, so we'll just, you know, there, there are those differences. Right. I will say one of the interesting differences when I was doing my research for my book, Portrait of Child Free Wealth, uh, I, I surveyed a couple hundred, uh, 300 plus child free folks. Mm. There's, uh, and I'm still diving the data, but looks like child free folks on average have less debt than parents. Mm. Okay. And, and that's, yeah. that is significant. You know, what I found is that for those people who ch achieved financial independence, they really, you know, did three things. They, they got out of debt, they stayed out of debt, and they maxed out their retirement accounts. Right. That's it. Like, nothing fancy. Like, you just, right. that's their entire financial plan. Um, right. and, and, you know, Matt and I might have some tweaks on that, but that right. was like, yeah. that was we'll it. Talk. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> And the basics actually work. Right. I think the way I look at it for the difference of child-free is the outcome at the end is different. So we're not passing on a legacy. You know, yeah, you know, my nephew's going to get whatever's left over. Shh, don't tell them. They'll probably like, you know, knock right. us off. But, right. <laughs> um, you know, or you share with giving or whatever. But it's not about passing on a legacy. So right. that changes your entire financial plan. And the other one that's kind of interesting that shifts the overall plan is a lot of child-free folks don't want to retire. 
Yeah, right. they, they live in what I'm calling file, financial independence, liver. They want to live a different quality of life now, not wait 25 years and retire. Um, they're following their dreams. They're, they're doing the jobs they want to do. They're opening the cupcake shop, whatever. Right. But those two are different ends, which then change many of the decisions you make in money. Does that make sense, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things you actually mentioned there without explicitly calling them out. Well, you did explicitly call it the debt thing. So less debt than the average person. Uh, typically don't want to retire. And maybe that also means you know, living more during, like it's not just working nine to five and raising kids throughout between ages 25 and 55 or whatever it would be. Maybe you are starting businesses as child-free. You are taking sabbaticals potentially. You've got less traditional career paths maybe is, is maybe what I can kind of translate some of that to. Um, but I think the two you really did mention there fairly explicitly, uh, low debt. Well, you did mention good savings too, but low debt and uh, a lack of need to retire or want desire to retire. And uh, really, I mean, more, no, no need to pass anything on really. So there's a few things here that we really can dive into, but I'm happy to go head to head in debt on the first one, because I think that, and potentially saving strategies, which we'll get into a little bit more later, those are maybe the two that we, I wouldn't even say we butt heads, particularly, but we have slightly different opinions on. Um, but I would never say that advice that you give is bad. And I don't think you'd say advice I give is bad either. So with debt, you often see clients pay that off quickly. I would almost wonder, and this is, uh, I feel good as an academic coming or talking to an academic, uh, is a correlation causation or like, why would they have less debt? Because there are things like they don't have to theoretically buy the bigger house. They don't have to do certain things that may often incur debt. Is it because child-free people are more intentional and better at paying off debt? Or is there a lifestyle difference that causes them to initially have less of it at, at the outset? Do you, do you have a strong yeah, indication either way? I don't have a clue. Um, kind of the data just tells you what the data tells you. It doesn't tell you why. I think when I've talked to people, I had some folks that said, yep, it was a purposeful thing. You know, debt was not part of our life. That was just a thing. Um, and, and that happens to be the way I do the financial planning. I, I'm more on the no debt camp. But I think the other part of it is, look, it's $284,000 to raise a kid from zero to 17. Like <laughs> just quarter million dollars just to have one. So I think that is part of it. Um, and I think it's just different life choices. Yeah, I because I, I mean, I guess from my perspective, and I don't have the data on this, but I would just guess it, it, in general, a child free person has, like you said, it's a lifestyle choice that has led them to less debt, not necessarily because they consciously did it or not, where some certainly have, but others, you kind of maybe fall into it that the fact like, oh, yeah, I just never bought the big house. I have a nice little bungalow that I've lived in for t- 24 years and I've never needed more than 1400 square feet you know, or whatever it is because I don't need to do the big expenses. I think that goes into, so the net worth one, I was surprised there's not much of a difference, like statistically no difference. Right. But I think as I kind of thought that through, that might be because of life choices. So right. if my goal is not to pass on a legacy to somebody else, my net worth doesn't have to be large. Right. You know, and, and that might be intentional. It's kind of weird to say, but like child-free folks could take a job that pays less because they don't have to worry about that, but it's right. more rewarding. So like it, it's, it's this overall financial picture. And right. when people ask me, well, how does being child-free impact your finances? And I'm like, it impacts everything. everything and yeah. like, I feel like I'm like little going too far, but I'm like, no, it kind of does. Your life choices, your education, your, your money. Your, right. It, and it's one of those things when I have people that say, well, how do I find a financial planner? I say, well, ask them how you being child-free changes their financial plan. Right. And if they go, well, I don't know. Well, then you just walk out the door. Like, you know, right. it's like, right. Um, but for me, it's like, okay, it's everything. I think right. the foundation is different. The outcome is different. So we end up just making different choices and that's okay. Right. But the, I think the other thing to keep in mind all, I'm almost all, let's, let's be technical. Financial rules assume you have kids. So if you're picking Close any to, general right? rule, you know, by 40, you have to have this amount of money. None of that. No, you don't. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I would say, all right, so all the rules of thumb, 
the ones that like go out in financial media and stuff that you read or like not to pick on this person but dave ramsey rules anything dave ramsey is family hold on hold on now. i came out of the dave ramsey camp actually so now we're gonna now we're gonna fight now see this is where we're button heads all right so dave what dave ramsey has done well is he has done well to teach people about behaviors with money and getting out of debt sure you cannot fight him on that you can fight him on whether or not you should be out of debt that's a different question you know which you know Fair. the way i look at it is it's recipes okay if you make cookies you make cookies you make brownies you make brownies dave ramsey's recipe is debt when it gets to steps four five and six which includes saving for college and all that yeah they don't fit us Right. But the basics of getting out of debt and not being on a budget and having an emergency fund, you're going to really fight me on having an emergency fund and getting out of debt? Depending on the debt, potentially. All right. So like, let's, let's knock the debt situation out. And this is where we differ. You would say, actually, I'll ask you, when is it good to pay off debt? My general advice is by, before you retire, you should have no debt. Fair enough. I okay. don't necessarily agree with that. That's your, that's your choice. The way I look at it for debt is debt to me is kind of like dieting. Okay. You're probably one of those people that can get a bag of chips and just eat one chip. All right. With debt, like if you can handle it well, maybe, but for most people they can't. So they're better off just not getting the bag of chips at all. Like to me, I don't know how you're going to argue, Oh, you should have credit card debt, which is 20% interest. Can you argue that one? No. So this is going to be interesting. This is where we're going to dive into the differences of kinds of debt. Yeah. Cool. So credit card, no. Student no. loans? Yeah, I'd probably pay them off fairly quickly, yeah. Me, my role is you shouldn't even take out a loan for, for education. It's not worth it. Um, we, can, we can have some arguments on that. Okay, great. Now we get to mortgages. It's kind of a little weird. Um, mortgage rates at 6 or 7%. Now I'm going, you got to pay that debt off pretty quick. Right. You, you going to argue with me on that? Uh, no, but I'll dive more into my opinions as you kind of go down this, this rack, this okay. track. Okay. Now we get into personal loans and, and car loans. I'm like, no, you buy your cars with cash because cars are a want, not a need. You know, it, it depends on where you're going with it. And the bonus is once you have pay, your debt paid off, you can put the rest towards investment. Right. So it's a different financial situation. And I actually encourage people pay off their house earlier because you, your behaviors change when you own everything. You know, it, it's okay. a different way of looking at it. Your house is secure. You're not going to have foreclosed. By the way, I'm also encouraged child-free folks. You can rent. It's okay, too. Right. But, right. but consumer debt, you know, I argue, I'm, I'm pretty, I don't look at this good or bad debt. It's all debt. Um, and it all right. should be wiped out as much as you can because it changes your life. And it changes your behaviors around money. Sure. So I'll, I'll tell you this, the way I'll kind of go into my opinion, because I don't think you're wrong necessarily. Like I said at the onset. But you're going to try to prove me I'm wrong. <laughs> Right. I don't think you're wrong, but I'll tell you how you are. Uh, I don't think it's a bad, I tell clients this all the time. I don't think it's a bad financial decision to pay debt off. There could be better financial decisions. So let's kind of go down the same track you went. Credit card debt. You should never have it. Uh, You should do whatever you can to pay that off. It's better than getting a 401k match. It's better than any, pay that off as fast as possible. Um, Then you get down to other like non-collateralized personal loans, maybe like eight, 10, 12% pay that off too. You don't want any of that. That That's terrible debt to have. Uh, Usually non-collateralized debt is going to be high rate. It's going to be bad for you. You're not going to want it. Uh, Student loans and mortgages as they are around that mid single digit, anywhere from five, I'll say anywhere from four and a half to 6%. You're in the gray zone of do you pay it off or not? We can have healthy debates there. I'll get into in a second. Anything over 6% though, you're probably going to want to pay it off. Mm -hmm. And that's probably your best bet again depends on your situation but most likely it's going to be your best bet uh once you get down to that four and a half to six percent range now you've got a decision to make about risk and return and how comfortable you are with it and where you want to go so i would argue if you have a four and a half percent mortgage do you need to pay that off faster than something else for instance looking at you know a lot of your clients do it yourselfers they're going to put that money into VTSAX or VTI or whatever else, potentially. That, on average, can get, let's even go conservatively and call it 9% or something like that. So now you have to take risk on by putting it in the market. As we can see this year, that has gone down significantly and you're in the hole. Uh, but over the long term, such as the period of a mortgage, you'd be better off financially to have invested that at getting 9% return than paying off 4.5% return. The difference is 
this is the only time I could probably ever say this in, in finances, paying debt down is a guaranteed return, air quotes mm-hmm. here, because you're not going to pay that interest. Is it worth taking on risk in order to get an additional four or 5% return? That's where it's not really my decision, but I'll walk the client through that decision and say, hey, it's up to you. Personally, for me, I'm happy to take on the additional risk. That's my own decision for my finances. And I talk to clients about that logic. Now go to the extreme in the last three years or so. And many people have gotten 30 year mortgages at three and a quarter percent. To me, I say, don't pay that off. I can pretty, I mean, even right now, pop it in an I bond before you do that. An I bond is basically guaranteed and it's getting nine point something percent right now. So in my mind, again, paying off debt isn't bad. I'll make that very clear. And I agree with you on that, but I think there could be better financial decisions than paying it down. Uh, And that's where I think we differ. If you have very low healthy debt, you could be better off by not paying it off, which is something that's very much so going to be a relic of the 2009 to 2021 era is going to be this historic low interest rate where it actually made sense to borrow. Pretty much every other era in history, though, pay down debt, I would say. Well, and I think where I'm going to push back is, you're right, on the math, you, you, you're probably right. If you're going to take that money and, and directly put it in the market, which by the way, people actually don't, uh, you know, they're more likely to sure. pay off the debt and lock it in. You know, if, if we're putting an extra 250 bucks a month towards their mortgage automatically, they're going to do that versus putting 250 bucks extra into the market, less likely to do it. It's just kind of that reality check of that. And I work, frankly, more on the behavior side. You know, right. the, the general rule is 80% of your money is your behaviors with money, not your money's behavior. Right. From a behavioral standpoint, I want to automate all that. I want to get debt out of your life and then focus on investing. Um, right. and, and that's a balancing act, but that's really about understanding the way people think. On paper, yes, you're right. There are better financial choices. Sure. And that's the hard part is going, we, on an Excel sheet, and you and I have done this before. We've kind of debated Excel sheets. And I'm going, cool. I agree with you on the Excel sheet. I right. don't agree with them on the behavior. It, and that's okay. the, the, the difference behind it. And, and that's where your behaviors, your ability to handle debt are probably more of an indicator of your financial success than the math behind it. Sure. And so maybe that goes even further into, again, knowing how people interact with money and, and for people listening to this, like their, and, you know, their relationship with money, debt, things like that um, may alter that. Because I think if I had, someone talked to me and need help for me and they came into my uh, you know, office, my virtual office here with $25,000 of credit card debt and they're contributing to their 401k. I mean, we have a very big issue here where this is probably the type of person who I would say pay off all debt. Like we just want to deal with debt. It's the easiest thing for you. As opposed to someone who maybe is quite responsible with money, but has a mortgage uh, and doesn't have any other real debt. And that's considered again, air quotes here, healthy debt all right, well, you know, I'm I'm not going to say go off and pay your mortgage off necessarily, but I think this is part of the art and the science is kind of what we're describing here, the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, I think maybe you probably lean heavier on the qualitative aspects of financial planning, whereas I say this is quantitatively the best answer. Now, how do I make that qualitative and tangible for the client and what they want? And, And again, maybe I'm, I'm, doing it backwards. And that's not how it should be done. But I think in my, I could say, this is the the best mathematical decision. How can we make this to where we don't stray too far from that? And then, you know, make it so it it fits into what you're comfortable with as the client. Um, Yeah. And I think, I I don't love using the words qualitative quantitative because I come with research that's a different meaning. Sure. The way I look at it is determine what the life you want is first, and then we'll make the finances work to match it. Well, I don't disagree with that either. Hold on. You started with the math. You're like, I got the math. Now I need to figure out how it fits you quantitative, qualitative side. But that uh, psychology-wise, we were saying behavioral-wise, yes. But the, the math still supports the lifestyle that is desired. It's a question of direction. Okay. We can, we can all get into like real technical, inductive, deductive reasoning, all that. But sure. bottom line is a lot of people stop themselves from living the life they want because of finances. And my answer is, nope, figure out the life you want, and then we'll change the finances. So right. if you tell me you want to be a digital nomad, live in a van, and travel the world, we'll make a life that fits that. But that's going to be a different choice on your finances, your career, your life, all that. You know, so what I do, I call it life and financial planning. 
So I right. think life and finances are intertwined. So what happens is I actually think the number side of it is the completely easiest stuff. The computer can do most of that for you. I mean, you, you know, you don't need a PhD for that, but the behaviors that go with it and how to get your life that you want is the hard one. So the challenge with being child free is you have the time, money, and freedom to do what you want. And we can solve the money problem and actually make more money, but lose the time and the freedom. Right. Right. Um, I've been tracking this and I actually spend more time talking with my clients about spending money than saving. Right. Because That's what you've told me before. They've already reached their goals ish. I'm like, go buy that car if you wanted it or whatever. Right. Um, you know, you want to take a six month sabbatical, go do it. And, and people go, well, but, 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 but I need to save. I need to do this. I need to I'm like, you, you're saving for a legacy to give to a, you know, whatever it is. If it's not your life. Right. I think, right. and that's why when I look at debt, look at finance in general, I'm looking at it from a slightly different lens. By the way, not right or wrong, it's just different. Right. You know, right. my, I believe it is possible to solve for a financial solution that ends up in more money, but that is a failure for the client. You know, because Fair. it's possible no, yeah. to, to, to solve for how do I have more money and not solve for their life. That, right. That's why I think the hard part is, you know, so, so, okay, you and I have different business models. I'm an advice only. Mm-hmm. Um, you do investment management. I don't do investment management. Right. So I'm only pure giving them advice on life and finances. Um, and I have no stake in their investments going up. I don't know right. if that changes my approach, but that is part of the picture. You mm-hmm. know, uh, it, it is part of where it goes. I mean, does that, what do you think? Does that impact the decision-making? I mean, I don't think it particularly does impact the decision making as a whole. I, I don't think we're that far off right here. I still think I tell people all the time, money is a means to an end. What life do you want? Now let's make the most logical decisions with it where you can still behaviorally be comfortable. Like that's why we do when we manage portfolios. Well, what are you comfortable with? What the portfolio that you can stick with and not get scared or you know cold feet with is the best portfolio for you. And you're basically saying the equivalent in financial planning. What I know I can get you to do as the financial consumer to make your life better, even if it's not the optimal mathematic way to do it, if I know you're going to do it this way and it's going to serve the life you want, that's the best way to do it for you. And I think that's your point. And I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, So it's finding, I suppose this is the challenge and this is where we can kind of disagree, but we can agree on the core concept. We're just disagreeing on the way to get there is whatever it is, debt in this case, what we're discussing, there's an intersection of behavior and, and then the, the mathematic side of like, what's the optimal way to do it. And you have to find that balance between the two because sometimes, and not always, sometimes they compete. Sometimes mm-hmm. the, the behaviors of all of us, not just clients, you and me as well, um, will get in the way of accomplishing what's optimal and that's better end result for the person to not do what's mathematically the best. So I think we're, we're talking about the same thing here. I think our approaches to the discussion and the working with our clients are, are probably a little bit different, particularly because you lead more with the life coaching and things like that. Um, but I think we still kind of get to the same place. Yeah. I mean, reality, let's do a reality check. You and I both are looking at this through a child-free lens. We're both kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're several deviations away from the rest of the financial market. So, I mean, right. like, and now we're talking about like, the last two or three points and how to, you know, <laughs> right, yeah. like, you know, we're getting way too accurate, but I mean, so I, I have prospects all the time. They, they reach out to me and go, Hey, I didn't even realize that there's a child-free financial planner out there. And I'm like, yeah, there's only two of us. It's mad. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully it'll be more in the future, but that, and then we're talking about different styles. And by the way, my tell everybody, when you look at a financial planner, try out two or three of them. Well, uh, right. two of us and see what, right. you, see, see what you like. Because it is a style, it's a match and all that. And, and you know, right. I have clients come to me, you know, they want to be heavily leveraged, heavy in debt. And I go, yeah, I'm not the right planner for you. Right. Um, right. You know, if you're in the Grant Cardone world, which is the 10X leverage, you know, debt is right. great. I'm not the, I can't help you. Right. Um, you know, it's not that I won't. I just don't have those skills. That's not the way I think. Right. Um, you know, we can debate, you know, which speed to pay off debt and how and like we're moving things around, but <laughs> We're real. 
we're still within this small bandwidth of, of the spectrum. Yeah. So. I, mean, I, I mean, really what we're talking about is how much different your life is to child free. If you are, if you, if you are a parent saving for a legacy, then solving for the most money to pass for the legacy is actually an easier way to do it. Right. It's a math equation. Right. Yeah. You know, and the math is actually rather simple. Like Pretty it's, much, you yeah. know, <laughs> a robo advisor could do that for you. Um, right. But if you're looking at living a different quality of life and a different life, that's where you have to look at things differently. And to your point, what you mentioned earlier, that's where things like robo-advisors cater to the standard life script of having children and doing all this. They're going to sit there and start recommending you do college accounts and stuff like that. And you're like, I don't need that. Uh, because, yeah, they're, they're kind of based on that, where that's what helps working with a child-free planner, where we know especially being child-free, we, ha- we are living that same life and we're knowing which things to drop and focus on. So let, let's kind of continue that conversation into some of the other items because we talked about debt so far. You've mentioned, you know, really retirement planning aspects of like, you know, digital nomads even retiring early, but also estate planning. So in terms of, uh, let's just cover those last two because I know we're, we're already kind of getting quite a long in time here. Uh, Retirement planning. Let's dive into that because this is another one. I don't think you and I differ very much, but we can go, you know, debate academically all day. But what are some differences for child free people as they even think about the general concept of retirement, which is already kind of a four letter word for some of us financial planners, but also how do they then approach what may be a different opinion of what retirement even is? Yeah. And I ask my clients, Two questions, really. First question is, do you care where your money goes when you die? Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that's a little pointed question, but like, bottom line, do you care? Right. And you'd be surprised how many clients go, no. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, then you die with your last hundred bucks, you're good with it? Yep. Okay. Well, that's, that's the estate planning and the legacy. Right. Then right. my next question is, do you want to retire? Right. And it's like that question of like, do you want to have kids? Is there another option? Like, yeah, there is another option. You know, maybe I want to work part time. I want to, you know, uh, you know, do whatever it is. Cool. Like I call it file, financial independence, live early and say, I want to live a different life. Right. And, but if your goal is not retirement, that changes your financial plan again. Right. So what happens is, you know, I'm now solving for a different problem than the standard advisor. Right. Um, you know, now we're going to talk about long term care. We're going to be talking about, you know, that question of who's going to take care of when you're older you know, social security, some of that to protect the end, but then how do we live a life in the middle? Right. Which is retirement planning is not now the goal. It's life planning. And how do I have, you know, the the days of working 25 years and getting the watch are gone. You know, it's just, it's just that old retirement model is, is, I don't know that people want to do that. Right. And I would even say, I mean, I I would a hundred percent agree with you that I will, I would guess I have two camps of, uh, clients here. One, and people, the, the, to your point, people say, I don't really ever want to retire. I've never thought of retiring because I think there's still that image of you sit on the porch in a rocking chair with your iced tea next to you doing a crossword puzzle. And you're like, I never want that. That sounds terrible. And like, yeah, fair enough. Uh, and then there's the other camp. So that, that's one who says like, I never want to retire. The other one is I want to retire as soon as possible. But oftentimes, and I don't want to put words in people's mouth when they say that because some people do still want to retire and just not have to work at all but what it is is I think they just say I don't want to have to go to a nine to five every day anymore I want to choose what projects I work on I want to choose if I have to work anything like that which may not be the same as retirement Uh, but I think a lot of people still kind of have mentally they have those bumpers of I want to retire early when really it's I want file. I want to financially independence live early, which is more realistic, uh, particularly because you can travel and, uh, you know, scale Kilimanjaro when you're in your 30s or 40s, a little tougher when you're 72 and retired. So do it now, you know? <laughs> well, so, so let me give you an example. I, and I mentioned this gentleman, another thing. So I interviewed Ryan, he, he retired in his 40, early 40s, kind of was like not stimulated, not loving it. Now what he does, he runs his own marketing company, Never works before 10, never works on Friday, and no more than 25 hours a week. I mean, Perfect. And, and when I talked to him, he was like booking time in Palm Springs for him, his wife, and, and their dog to go and hang out because he work remotely. That is a different life. Okay. Right. That just, and by the way, I'm jealous. Like he's got it down. Like he's right. much better than I am. 
but that's the, the, the difference. And I think the challenge for people is to stop and go, what do you want? And I, I, I watch out for what I call the child-free midlife crisis. Mm-hmm. This is when you've hit your personal, professional, and financial goals. And now what? Right. Like there's like this moment in life. And I, and I hit it about 40. And I realized for parents, they just shift their goals to their kids. This is where they put that pressure on. You have to be the soccer star or whatever. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. okay, you got to go to Harvard. You got But for us, you hit your personal, professional, financial, educational goals. And then you're like, what life do I want to live for the rest of my life? Right. Yeah. And this is where I work with a lot of clients going, good question. Let's right. answer this. Right. Um, you know, couples, sometimes it means one's taking a turn. We do a gardener in the rose, different approach. But it's, it's, it's a moment that most people don't even get to get to in their life. Right. You know, right. They don't actually reach their goals. But for child-free folks, I got people in their 30s and I got people in their 60s that have hit that. Right. Right. I don't have the answer of it. Like if we could figure out how to deal with midlife crisis, we'd probably make a whole lot more money, but like, you know, it, just, <laughs> yeah. um, it, it yeah. is different. Yeah. I think it's absolutely different on that front. I think you're, you're talking a lot about the, the journey that people go through and realizing or, or specific examples where people have accomplished that completely different lifestyle compared to what the life script says and what the typical nine to five for 40 years, get a watch and a pension and you're done. Well, there are no more watches or pensions. And admittedly, you're probably getting laid off before you hit 40 years anyway. So uh, now it's up to people to design the life they want. And that's just that much more um, achievable when you're child free. So as it comes to, uh, we're not going to get too technical, but slightly on the technical side here. I mean, is saving different if you have early retirement, you're not trying to leave money behind? What, what? When you are saving, like how does that change, or what are things to consider as you as you're saving for whatever that life goal is going forward? Yeah, I don't get like too like fancy schmancy with investing and all that. You know, I'm gonna, my question is always: Do you want your investments to work, or you want them to be sexy? Like, right? You know, just got them to work. I think it's a question of how much money is enough, right. which is a hard question. When do you get to get off the gerbil wheel? We right. have work. I, a really hard question. Um, it's, it's more of making your financial plan match your life. Right. And here's the thing, your neighbors are really going to get confused. And, and one of my, one of my clients talked about this, when I said, you know, there's just like this middle-class work ethic, or you call it the process work ethic, or, you know, whatever right. you want to call it. There's a puritanical work ethic, whatever it's where like, you're expected to work hard for the rest of your life. Right. Cool. Well, what happens when you don't have to? Right. And that's where people are like, um, I'm going to pretend like I'm working. Like, you, right, know yeah. <laughs> you know, people always tell me when I'm like, what are you going to do when you retire? They're like, I'm going to volunteer. Oh, cause you're so, it's not even about good doing or anything. It's just because to your point, the Protestant work ethic, I got to keep moving. I got to do something, you know? That's and I suffer for that myself. But my point is at some point you have saved enough. Right. And you get to this point, they call it the boring middle where you're just working your plan. You know, it's going to work out. And there's like no excitement to your financial plan. By the way, that's where you want to get to. Like you, right. you want your finances just not to have to think about them. But you get to this point and now it's like, now what? Right. Well, that's when you buy the boat, boat or, you know, go on the trip or do whatever you got to do. Right. But people, what I see clients do is they move the goalposts. Yeah. They'll always. say like, I need 2 million. Cool. They'll get to 2 million. Like, well, let's do three. I'm like, why? Like, right. right. You know, whatever, the, whatever your magic You're going to be fine. Is. Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I see with the child free community and, and what we talk about is time, freedom, career freedom, not even having to even disregarding the nine to five, just being able to say, ah, you know what, I'm going to take this lower paying job because I enjoy the work more. That's a freedom that a lot of people with kids and families don't have. They need to maintain, you know, the, the be, able, be able to support the, the rest of their family. So with that, uh, early retirement is quite common with child free. So one of the biggest things I see is that because we've all been trained to do this, people max out their 401k and there's nothing, I saw it, there's nothing wrong with this, but then they get to 55. They want to stop working. They've got a million dollars in their 401k. And then they look around and go, Oh crap, I'm 54. I can't even touch the 401k yet. So what do I do? Uh, and that's where I would even say for a lot of child-free people, I have to shift the focus where people are like, oh, I get a tax deduction for doing the 401k. And I'm like, you do. But if you're retiring at 52, that tax deduction is not going to help you at all because, and again, retirement, it's an amoebic term. But if you're going to step away from work and need to pull some money from what you've saved, 
you're going to need to have money that you can access and you can't get a 401k until you're 59 and a half or you can't access those dollars. Uh, so I would say um, on some of the technical side, you have to know where to save those dollars that you are stashing away and should still probably take advantage of 401ks to some extent. We can talk about that another time. Other different types of saving vehicles, investment accounts, et cetera, um, whatever else you want to do, rental real estate. But which which of those buckets do you fill at what time and how to support what you're saying? Your sabbatical when you want to step away for you know five years in your 40s or whatever else, you're going to start your own practice. Those types of things are quite different for child-free because it's not like you're going to retire at 65 after you put your three kids through college. That's a different plan. That's a different uh, trajectory. I, I think for me, I always tell clients, investing is really easy. Taxes and where to put it and how to plan it, that's really hard. Like, right. you know, like the, the actual, what do you invest in? Really easy. Right. And, and I think the other thing to continue on this is what do you not need to do? So for right. example, child-free folks probably don't need life insurance. Right. Unless your spouse needs your income or you have like a business that you need to buy out or something, you don't need life insurance, but you do need disability insurance because if you are hurt, you get a stroke, you you need that. We need law. We need a plan for long-term care. You know, what's long-term care insurance or pay, you know, so we shift, but in life insurance, a great example where if if you ask, if you ask a life insurance agent, do you need life insurance? The answer of course is yes. Like asking a dog that's hungry, you know, like he's going to say yes. Yeah. But for child-free folks, not a big deal. On the flip right. side, I have clients at in their 30s asking for long-term care insurance, which, by the way, historically, people don't get till their 50s or their 60s. Right. So it's just a different priority set right. um, that needs to reflect you. And, and that's where the complexity, and that's where, uh, yeah, I'm going to do the shameless plug. That's where financial planners help, like right. looking at the, like these pieces. And that's right. also where the general rules hurt you. You know, general rule is you need 10 to 12 times your, your, your income for life insurance. Not if you're child free. Right. Yeah. And specifically, I will do a caveat here as well, particularly if you're a dual income household. Well, no, hold on. Hold on. If you're single income and no kid, what do I need life insurance for? All right. So say for instance, 30 years old, couple are each 30 Mm -hmm. years old. They bought their first house. They still have $200,000 on the mortgage. One doesn't work at all. Okay. You didn't answer my question on the single people. Oh, I single people. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Single people don't particularly need it. And I mean, if they've got any assets at all, they don't need it. Right. You're single. On the couple, yeah. If you want to pay off the debt, by the way, I just talked about paying off the debt earlier that you fought me on, but now we're going to pay it off of life insurance. All right. I'll go with you. But I'm joking. It's, you know, it depends on where you put the plan. But hey, if I paid off my debt, I don't need life insurance. If I got to pay off the house, maybe. But my, my employer may cover enough for one or two times my salary for right. five bucks. Right. You know, I don't or need family. this complex hybrid, blah, 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 life insurance. Agreed. I also yeah. don't need the hybrid life insurance, long-term care com- combination. You know, yeah, there are some people might, but they're very few and far between right. you know, the, the, in the child-free world. If you're Agreed. a parent, you need that life insurance immediately. Like, right. there's no doubt on that. But I would even say, and you probably agree with me, I guess, is that life insurance is one of the most oversold products in finance. Everyone, so, all right, that's an extreme. But I would say okay. a lot of, they're all, to your point earlier, insurance salespeople think everyone needs life insurance and they're going to sell you a way that it's going to fit into your situation, whether or not you actually need it. We're both the only financial planners, okay? Right. We only make money from our clients. Right. We don't get commissions to sell stuff. Right. That's why we can say life insurance sucks, okay? When your commission is off your life insurance, you're going to sell it. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's like going to a doctor and the doctor gets paid for each script they pay, you know, they put out. Well, right. you're going to wonder about what they do every time. Well, some do. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, somebody can call themselves a financial advisor and just be selling life insurance. Right. Well, then of course that it's a hammer and nail routine. Of course, right. life insurance. And like now we get these people like uh, um, infinite banking and IUL and like, they're just fancy life insurance programs. Right. Yeah. And the way I look at life insurance, this is, uh, sorry, you got me on a tangent, but <laughs> Hybrid life insurance, you know, where, you know, whole life, all that to me is like a spork. It's a, right. food, a, a spoon and a fork together. It doesn't do either job well. Right. You know, it doesn't do right. life insurance well. It doesn't do uh, investing well, but we're going to sell it because it works. Right. Like, and I'm like, I don't need a spork. 
Okay, right. I need yeah. something to do the job. Right. I have soup and a salad. Okay. I need both. <laughs> I need both utensils. Yeah, that's that's pretty funny. Uh, because I agree with you. Yeah, life insurance is definitely a difference for child free. So, all right. So we've got a few things here. We, we, you and I are passionate about these topics, so we get down rabbit holes fairly quickly. But let's bring it back to the top and sum it up. Debt pay down is often beneficial for child free people, maybe more aggressively uh, than than people who have children. Um, they have more often capacity to do that as well. And it is in a lot of ways, uh, the safer route because you can minimize risk doing that. So uh, it may be the option or a more popular option for child free. Uh, saving strategies going into retirement may differ because retirement means something different for pretty much every child free person. It's not the standard you hang up uh, you know, the, the boots one last time at age 65 and you ride off into the sunset. That's kind of a, a different lifestyle that most child-free people don't subscribe to. So in saving for retirement, there are different strategies that are could probably be a whole series of podcast episodes on, on its own, but you may want to talk to a financial planner about what makes sense for what you're trying to build. Life insurance, less needed typically. There are instances in which it is needed, but if it is, it's usually going to be a very simple life insurance only product, typically. Uh, and again, that's something you probably need to talk to your financial planner for your situation. And lastly, long-term care. I wonder what the magnitude of, of child-free people compared to the general population, how many more times uh, child-free people buy it compared to the average population? Oh, hold on. I got to give, give you a stat on this one, Matt. All right. Um, so the census, when they looked at childless, they said, they, they looked at, do you get any support from your family when you're over 55? Right, right. They found 2.5% of childless individuals got any financial support from their family. Right. So, I mean, that's like nobody. Right. But the same study found 1.5% of parents got any support from their family. Right. Yeah. They got less. Wild. Yeah. Wild. Okay. So the difference is we know we need to take care of our long-term care. Right. We're not relying on or expecting somebody to do it. And we'll have to do a whole separate podcast on long-term care, but uh, you know, most of my clients ask me about long-term care at some point. And if they don't, right. I'm going to ask that. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I think it's the, probably the, if you had to ask me like, what's the one piece that child-free people need in their finances more than, than people with kids, I'd probably say long-term care is number one uh, in terms of the things that, that differs because yeah, I mean, it's, it's really that key component that, that is different. So uh, yeah, there's a number of things. We haven't even covered them all. It gets, quite endless. You can pretty much bring up any topic and I can tell you why it's different um, for a child-free person, couple, group, et cetera. I can tell you why it's different. Um, so with that said, covered a lot of stuff there. If you want us to dive into any uh, rabbit holes or like further uh, examine one of those topics, email us. We're at childfreepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, make sure to send us messages, comments, critiques, topic suggestions, anything like that. And uh, we definitely take those into consideration. Uh, but with that, this is just the basics of, of the financial topics for Child Free. I'm sure we'll have more and more specific episodes in the future diving into those specific topics. So uh, yeah, let us know what would be of interest. Any final thoughts for us here, Dr. J? You know what? The, the thing to keep in mind is your life is different. You don't have to follow everybody else's script. There you That's go. all that is. Perfect. And that means different, different financial decisions than, than others as well. Good stuff, Dr. J. Thanks again for joining me as always. And we'll be back again next week. Child Free Life and Money is an educational and entertainment podcast only. For further disclosure, look at our websites at www.anthrofywealth.com or www.childfreewealth.com. Either way, consult with your financial planner to see if anything we discuss pertains to you. Thanks for listening.